Okay, so here we're going to go over some of the periodic table trends. Hopefully you're familiar with the general organization of the periodic table, and this will allow you to develop a greater um, understanding of exactly why it's organized the way that it is and what inferences we can make about certain elements. So starting with uh, ionic trends, elements on the left, which are metals, tend to lose valence electrons to form positive ions. Remember, valence electrons are the outermost electrons. So in this image here, the gray circle represents the neutral form of the atom, and the red represents the um, ion form. So when we're losing those valence electrons, the radius is getting smaller. We notice that the atom becomes smaller. In contrast here, elements on the right side, the nonmetals, tend to gain electrons uh, to become negative ions. You see here's our neutral atom in the gray, and when we're adding uh, that negative electron, uh, we could see that the radius is actually uh, becoming larger uh, in this case. Because here we're losing that outer um, shell, those outer electrons becoming smaller. Here we're kind of gaining more, and that's become, causing our radius to become larger in those ions. So cations, positive ions, tend to form smaller radius. Anions, or negative ions, tend to form a larger radius. So we're talking about ions here. We're looking at binding and that's occurring or bonding. Keep in mind, two of the same type, so two negatives or two positives will repel each other, and a positive and a negative will attract one another. See that here. See that here. A positive and a positive are repulsive, and a positive and a negative are attractive. And that's going to be important to get to molecules and how things bind together. So our periodic trends properties of elements tend to occur in a periodic way known as a trend, and as you move across a period or down a group is what we're going to be looking at. Knowing uh, element trends allows us to make predictions about an element's behavior, and we're going to see that here. So starting first with atomic radius, it's the measure of the size of an atom. For elements that occur as molecules, the atomic radius is half the distance between nuclei of identical atoms, you see right here. The average distance from the center of the nucleus to the edge of the adjacent electron cloud is determined to be the radius. So what does this look like? What's our trends look like? Well, atomic radius increases as you move down a group. So let's just look at group one here. As we move down our group or our family, we see the radius is increasing. Well, why does this occur? It actually occurs to a lesser extent to all of them here, we notice. This increase that we see in our radius is because of the increased number of electron energy levels. The more energy levels, the larger the radius. So our, if we compare our um, row 2 here, or our period 2, as we go down to period 4, we notice these, our radius all gets larger. Putting that in a different kind of way to visually see that, you can see these are trying to give you a 3D effect with the height of columns. And we could see here these columns are smaller, indicating the radius is smaller, and these are taller, indicating a larger radius. So we have an increasing going from right to left, and increasing in radius going from top to bottom. Now what tends to throw students here is the atomic radius generally decreases as you move from left to right. So if we look at period 4, for example, all the way on the left here we see a large radius. If we continue down that period to get to here, we see a smaller radius occurring down this end. This is due to the increase in negative charges, providing a greater pull by the positive nucleus reducing the radius. So what does this mean? Well, here we have one electron on the outside, one negative charge way on the outside, which is allowing the radius to be quite large. That positive charge can't really, of the nucleus can't really pull much in. Here we have a lot of electrons on the outside, creating a greater negative charge, giving those positive protons in the nucleus something greater to pull on, pulling them closer, reducing the overall atomic radius. Um, ionization energy uh, that is basically the minimum amount of energy required to remove a valence electron, forming a cation. Cations are positive ions. Ionization energy increases up a family and from left to right down a period. Uh, helium, HE, requires the greatest amount of energy to remove a valence electron. We see that here, the greatest amount of energy. See, all our noble gases, helium, neon, argon, require a lot more energy to remove that electron than, say, our alkali metals, which are lithium, our sodium, our potassium. Again, we're looking at trends here. 
Electron affinity. Electron affinity is the amount of energy released when an electron is added to a neutral atom or molecule to form an anion. Anions are negative ions, and it occurs when we add an electron. This follows a similar trend to ionization energy across the periodic table. So again, if we learn one, we can see electron affinity has some of the same properties to that. Metallic character refers to the level of reactivity of a metal. It increases as you go down a family. The most reactive metals are found in the lower left portion of the periodic table. So if you have a periodic table, take a look at it. You want to find cesium, which is going to be in that lower left-hand portion. It's not found in nature as a free element since it reacts explosively with water and will ignite spontaneously in air. Francium, at far as the same way, it's below the cesium in the alkali metal group, but is also very rare that most of its properties have never been observed. So these are very reactive. These have a lot of that metallic character. A non-metallic character uh, relates to the tendency to accept electrons during chemical reactions, kind of the opposite of what we just discussed. Nonmetals tend to gain electrons in chemical reactions and have a high attraction for electrons within a compound. The most reactive nonmetals reside in the upper right-hand portion of the periodic table, fluorine being the most reactive since noble gases are basically unreactive. So we're looking at trends. Noble gases are unreactive. We want to look at fluorine being the most reactive um, with the non-metallic character. A small sample of pale yellow liquid fluorine is considered is condensed at liquid nitrogen. So you can see that here, very, um, keeping it very cold. Not to be confused with the major fluorine containing mineral fluorite. So again, fluorine, fluorite might sound familiar, very distinctly and very different properties. Lastly here, metallic and non-metallic characters, more of a general trend. There's no clear, distinct division between metallic and non-metallic character. As you move across the periodic table, there's an increasing tendency to accept electrons, which is a non-metallic property, and decrease the possibility of an atom that would give up one or more electrons. Put the picture here, going from black to white, you see this large gray area. So showing that there's not a clear division, it's kind of this general trend that occurs. So again, just to go back to the first slide here of our general trends, we see how electron affinity changes, ionization energy, atomic radius, again, will increase as we go top to bottom and right to left. Electron affinity follows ionization energy. And that metallic and non-metallic character is kind of that kind of gray area, that black to white kind of transition that does occur. So you may have to review this just a little bit, focus especially on atomic radius, uh, learning some of the key terms here. And this will help us develop trends to better understand elements of the periodic table that we not, may not be able to specifically study.